you for joining us, Max. Uh, let's begin with addressing some things you said last year, Orology Forum 2019, in your panel, Control Freak. Uh, does it feel like a partnership or does it occasionally feel like you're actually dealing with a control freak, so to speak? Um, I think it's a question of size uh, at both ends. The, um, I know that most of the big brands have got this wet dream called Louis Vuitton, where basically you go directly to the client and you have nobody in the middle. It seems pretty, that's what we're seeing all over the world. And then you've got exceptions, like an incredibly beautiful exception, like Rolex or Patek, who say, you are my retail partners, I believe in you, we work hand in hand, and it's a real, it seems a real partnership. Um, and then you've got um, small guys who would love to exert pressure, but don't have the power to do so. So they just um, to do as best as they can. Uh, if I just take our little um, project, we've only got 25 retailers in the world. Clearly, to, to sell and present a, a piece like ours, you need an enormous amount of energy, 100 times more than to send any of the other brands. So we are grateful. <laughs> to our retail partners who actually take that energy, which they could make tons more money selling other products to try and educate clients. So um, we're very much in a grateful state. So based on that, in what ways today in this current climate, can the small guys you're referring to take advantage and what keeps you safe as opposed to the big luxury brands that are suffering today, what disadvantage do you see for them that is actually your advantage for the small guys, you know, that allows that small nook to slip in and cuckold them? Do you see tables, any table turning in any sense and in what way? Well, this whole COVID uh, first semester is a perfect example. Something absolutely incredible happened to us. Uh, early March, I was terrified. I thought it was the end of the world. And we are finishing our first semester as the best first semester in sellout of our history. Oh my God. Now, how do you explain that? For half of that semester, virtually 95% of our retailers were closed. Uh, we had to send our, our, our people back home, etc., etc. What happened? Well, first thing which I see happened is that in social media, the big brands disappeared. They just choo, dis disappeared. While us small independents who've always been um, talking, inspiring, engaging with our, our tribe of followers were even way more active because we were blocked at home and everybody was blocked at home. So we started all these incredible dialogues and I had no idea three months ago what an IG live was and I ended up doing IG lives all the time and responding to people. I, I've been talking a lot about humanity over all these years and um, especially as, as retailers, I saw that the retailers who had personal relationships with their clients were actually engaging them 10 times more. And what happened is that we engage our, our retailers who had humanity relationships engaged and the result is there. There are probably many, many other reasons. Maybe it's 15 years of hard work, maybe it's all sorts of other things, but I think this was the proof of what I was saying. So you were right, human touch. Bravo and congrats. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to now the second point. Um, it's true that the world of retailers has changed a lot. The brands have changed a lot, but retailers have changed a lot. I feel that um, the economy works in a pretty Darwinian way. If you don't bring value, you disappear. There are virtually no more distributors left in the world because they were not actually bringing value. Today, if a retailer considers it's only geography, meaning I have got that great location and I've got the inventory, he or she is going to disappear because then the brand can just take the same real estate and has got the inventory. And I think um, retailers have evolved. And we've got the best example here with the Siddiqui family who have understood that you have to engage, educate, inspire. Um, and the era of the merchants is going to die. So, in light of that, you mentioned quite 
pro pro prophetically and aptly, Darwinism, based on what you've said here, what made you decide to partner with Moser and Ahmed Sadiqi and Sons for the piece you just released? I know that you created a collection with Moser, LM101, MBNF, and H. Moser, and then a single piece for Ahmed Sadiqi and Sons for the 70th anniversary. What was it before this, you know, dreaded COVID-19 situation that you decided to do this? And even, even if not, you know, regardless, what made you make the judgment call that this is the right time to release this with these two people, with these two entities? So there was nothing Darwinian in that, uh, <laughs> except fate, um, because we started that project two, three years, two and a half years ago during Dubai Watch Week. Previous Dubai Watch Week, we sat down with Edward uh, Melon and I pitched him the idea then. So again, Dubai Watch Week was the, the center. Um, no, what, what did we, the reason we did this is always the same. Wouldn't it be cool if, which is our mantra, which is our business model, our business strategy, wouldn't it be cool if? And it was all about working with people we love and creating products we love that neither of us would have done separately. And I think the, the, the result was amazing. Now, why did we decide to launch in the middle of COVID? Um, it, was a, it was a tough call. And before that, I'd launched the Bulldog already on 24th of March, just the, the worst part of COVID. And um, what happened is when we launched Bulldog, we were thinking, oh my gosh, what are we doing? And we'd actually done it because we'd already delivered like 12 pieces to the market, which were more, half of them pre-sold. And the retailers were looking at us going, I can't invoice them if you don't talk about it. So we launched Bulldog a bit forced. It was not really our plan. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the feedback was incredible. I got, I will not, I'm not exaggerating. I got dozens and dozens of messages from people that day telling me, you made my day. You made me smile. And in this week, it's never happened. And I thought, wow we're actually making people happy. <laughs> and, uh, and so that gave us the courage. And we talked a lot with Edward uh, Melon and uh, said, should we do this again? And, and the result was mind boggling, mind boggling. Well, I think first because it was a great project, a great product, also because um, nobody was talking. And I was taught very early in my life um, a, a simple lesson. I've got a very low voice like my dad used to have. And when I'm in an environment where people have got loud voices, I'll voice loud, nobody hears me. So I very quickly in life learned to shut up when everybody's talking and just to wait for that little moment where everybody stops talking and then you put your head up and go, hey guys, here I am. And this is exactly what we did without knowing it. Virtually nobody, none of the big brands were presenting anything the media was, was so thirsty. The, the co collectors were just like bored to death. There was nothing happening. And here we go. Hey, guys. Moser, MBNF, we had a ball creating these two crazy pieces. The first time in the world, it's a double collab. And everybody was like, whoa, this is so cool. Result, it's never happened before. In four days, four days, all 60 of our LM101s were sold. That is, in our history, never happened. And, um, and so, yeah, um, we've learned so much during these last six months. And I think what we were talking about at Dubai Watch Week was more than ever relevant. Yeah, wow. So there wasn't a specific reason why those two entities, the, the project just happened to be ready by then, or? Oh, yeah. Because I know- It was, it was had been ready. I mean, it'd been, I mean, yeah, look, uh, we had, especially on the Moser piece where we'd added the, the dial like this and the, the uh, cylindrical hairspring. I mean, these are, these are major technical uh, yeah. projects. You don't do that in six months. And the uh, same went with us integrating the double hairspring, which changes the whole cinematic of the movement. But this is clearly not a six-month project. Um, but it, it's, I, I think it's, it's really uh, a great example of, um, of something which has become one of my mantras is just try, just try stuff. 
I mean, you, you keep on failing if you don't try. But if you try a lot, you will fail a little, but you will succeed a lot. So just try. I agree. Very pro. Wow. Okay. So the last point. The other issue is trust. Yeah. Uh, a lot of brands have abused retailers. A lot of retailers have abused brands. And uh, I see, for example, um, that where we work the best is where the retailers trust me and actually allow me and my team to speak with their clients. That's where our sales are really great. And those who think, oh my God, he's going to take my clients away, um, don't allow us to interact. And I get it. They've been burned. Uh, they're like, oh, I don't want to do this again. Um, but I, you, you need two to tango. And too many in, these, in, these two, in this equation have been burnt one from the other. So, in light of trust and, you know, uh, getting burnt and so on, in crisis mode, they say, you know who your real friends are. And uh, are you discovering that today in regards to your statement? Uh, no, because <laughs> after 15 years, I know who they are. <laughs> and, and we had no surprises. The people we thought were incredible partners were there, and those were lukewarm, disappeared. So there were, there were no surprises. Um, I think that the biggest surprise for me was the fact that those we knew were partners were so incredible. Um, of course, over all these, especially the three really tough months, no retailer was going to buy anything for inventory. But as the sales were so crazy, they kept on calling us like, please, please deliver those watches. So we did. So we worked over time. Our watchmakers were day and night in the, in the workshops, even though it was COVID. And, um, and they all paid like in five days. Amazing. So all our retail partners usually pay us in 30 days, which is our, our Swiss norm. And I didn't have to ask for anything. And suddenly, I mean, we would deliver the watch. And boom, five days later, the money was on the account. And we're like, wow, we're so grateful. We're coming back to the being grateful. I've got goosebumps actually thinking about it. <laughs> it was like, That's so incredible. We didn't even have to ask them. They knew that for us small creators, it was going to be much tougher than for the big boys. And, and they were there for us. And, and that, again, I will never forget that. Those are things which, which really make a living. Wow, so you didn't need a pandemic to know. I showed also that they could trust us because we launched our e-shop. E and of course, historically, when a brand launches an e-commerce platform, it usually is to try and steal sales from their retailers. It's, it's, a, it's normal. Yeah. I mean, then we understand how it works. And what we did, we said, we don't want to do that. I mean, not all these people have supported us. So two things happened. When we launched the LM101 Moser, we had kept seven pieces for us out of the 60. They were sold in 12 hours. I mean, people on the eShop buying them and whatever. So on the next morning, we put waiting list. And in 36 hours, we got 52 people who registered on the waiting list. So what did we do then? We started calling all our retailers saying, hey, have you sold yours? Yes. Oh, okay. Thanks. No, you haven't sold. Let me send you three clients. And in 48 hours, half the retailers who hadn't yet sold because it had only been out for like two days, half the retailers sold all their pieces to clients we sent to them. It's a great way of showing that a, a brand e-shop can actually be there to help your retailers. And the yeah. second thing we did is that when we launched the, uh, the e-shop, we actually add now every two weeks one piece from one of our retailers. So we feature two to three pieces of ours, never more. We're not going to put our whole collection because anyway, we can't deliver. So two or three pieces we actually can deliver. And if it's sold, we take it off. And every two weeks, we feature one amazing piece like now we've got West Time from Los Angeles. They've got the last um, HM3 frog in titanium in the world, new one. So we're featuring them. And if it's sold or after two weeks, we will then feature um, the Hourglass, who's got the last HM6 titanium in the world, and et cetera. So we're calling up all our retailers saying, 
what exactly, oh, do you still have that piece, which is the last one in the world? We will feature it on our eShop and help you sell it. It's a two-way highway. It's two to tango. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's on point. Okay. Well, I learned very wonderful things today. Wow. Thank you so much, Max. It was super joyous. Perfect. <laughs> you take care of yourself. Have a great summer. You too. Bye, Dom. Bye-bye.